What is his phone? It's a droid. I don't know. Okay, I got another mic pack on my left side, so then if you want to clip it on the right side, attach to that. It's in the tie, it's in the knot. Is it still going to work? I didn't have that much time with you. The real estate king, two times best selling author, Hoff of the best at what he does here in Athens, Georgia. He teaches about big money energy. Ryan wow. What's going on? What's up, man? Thanks. What's up? My name is Ryan Surhan, if you don't know. I'm a real estate broker. I'm based in New York City. I run my own real estate firm based in New York. We just opened up our own headquarters in Soho. I took 15,000 square feet, which if you're a small business owner is an insane amount of square footage for your first space in the center of Soho in New York City. Completely, completely crazy. But we just ended our first year and we did $900 million in sales, which like, whew, was a good amount. But if I think back to my whole career from when I got into it to kind of where I am now, all the good advice, all the bad advice, everything that I've been given, it all kind of boils down to three things, right? Three things that are incredibly important to anyone who runs a business, is starting a business, or has been in a business for a really, really long time. And that's the actual business, that's the work, okay? That's the brand, and that's the energy that pulls it all together. The business, the brand, and the energy. BBE, that is it. That, those are the ingredients, right? That's the recipe. And the business is, what are you selling? The brand is how do people know you're even selling it? And then the energy is why should they buy it from you? When you really think about it, where I come from, everybody is a salesperson. And we were all born in some way, shape, or form to do sales in some way. Even the pharmacist is selling hydrocortisone cream to somebody who's itchy. We're all in sales. Except when I started, I was not a born salesperson whatsoever. My whole family is athletes. They're all in finance. Everyone's name starts with J, except for me. My name starts with Ryan. Slightly a black sheep, and the only thing I really liked doing was theater. My parents had me play every single sport known to the human race, and I sucked at every single one of them. And I didn't think I was ever gonna get into sales, except my first business, my first sales business ever was when I was 10 years old. We had moved to this house, this farm actually, north of Boston. I went to the grocery store, and I saw that they were selling firewood. I was like, wait, wait. We just moved into this farm. My dad's cutting down all the trees. They're selling firewood. Jackpot business idea. I've got all this lumber around my parents' house and they're just getting rid of it. I could probably cut it up and sell it and make money because I didn't have a job. My parents wouldn't pay me any money for any kind of chores or anything other than like a couple bucks to go pick up some sticks. And I went to my parents and I said, if I could sell the wood that you're cutting down to create the lawns and all that, can I keep the money? And at the grocery store, they were advertising a cord of wood for 50 bucks. This whole field of forest that my dad's cutting down, that must be like hundreds, thousands of dollars worth of wood. And all I gotta do is cut it down or have someone else cut it down and I'll just sell it and it'll be amazing. It's like literally free inventory. And they said, sure. So I took a little bit of money between my brother and I that we had saved up and it got me my first ad in the local Topsfield, Massachusetts newspaper. I was 10, my little brother was seven, um, and we called it, his name is Jack, my name is Ryan, and because of the Tom Clancy novels, we called it Jack Ryan Wood. <laughs> and it was the greatest company name ever. And we put it in there, and it was a quart of wood for 50 bucks, and we let it rip. The next day after we ran the ad, I remember my mom calling me out, I was like in the lawn doing something, she's like, Ryan, someone's on the phone for you, he wants to buy your firewood. She's like, yes, my first customer. And I like ran to the house. I was so excited for my first business call ever. I picked up the phone and the guy was like, saw your ad in the newspaper, are you selling wood? And I was like, yes, sir. I'm the CEO of Jack Ryan Wood. It's like, all right, I want two cords of wood at my house tomorrow, can you deliver it? It's like, great, awesome. Hung up the phone and all I could think about was the money. A hundred bucks, I'd never had a hundred bucks in my whole life. And then I had to think about how I was actually gonna do that because I hadn't really figured out how I was gonna cut up the wood. And then I hadn't really figured out how I was going to deliver said wood. 
And if you don't know what a cord of wood is, once you look it up, right, a cord of wood is like eight feet by four feet by four feet of firewood. And I just sold two of those that I hadn't cut up yet and had no means of delivery for, for a hundred bucks. So I asked my parents if they could help me and I will never forget, my mom said to me something that I, I think is probably the best business advice she'd ever given me. She said, no, Ryan, you wanted to start a business. You need to figure out solutions to your own problems. And I was 10 years old with my seven year old brother. But then I remembered we had a guy who was helping cut down these trees and his name was Biff. And he had this big red pickup truck. I was like, ooh, my second employee. I'm gonna get this guy to help me out. And I asked him and he was kind of disgruntled about it. I was like, right, we'll cut up the wood and we'll do it. We had a lumber cutter thing. He's like, yeah, I'll, I'll, sure, I'll help you. We load it up, we go to the guy. He sees that the guy's got this really, really long driveway. He's like, nah, I'm not going down that whole driveway. I'm like, okay, got it. My first disagreement with an employee. <laughs> well, maybe you could this time and I'll cut you in a little bit. He's like, nope, this is America. I don't have to do what you tell me to do. I'll never forget that's that what he said to me. He hit a flip, a little switch, and the back of the pickup truck flipped open. All the wood fell out into the middle of the road and he left me and my little brother in the middle of the road. And the guy we sold the wood to came up and he said, that's not what I paid for. I'm like, well, right, but um, I could figure it out. He's like, well, if you deliver it and put it on my porch, then I'll pay it. And I know what a quart of wood looks like. That's not a quart of wood. That looks like not even a full cord. And now this guy is giving me like real heavy anxiety and I didn't know what to do. And so I thought in a moment, what would a smart person do? Aha, a smart person would stick his little brother in a bush and then walk home and get his mom. And I got there and I told him, I said, hey, listen, we've had a little mishap with our delivery man for our first business order, but my dad decided to help. He drove me back and we got a wheelbarrow. We would put it in the back. They were more upset about what I did to my little brother and how I left him there and the whole thing. And he watched me. I think it took me like three hours as I took all that wood, put it in a wheelbarrow, took it all the way down the driveway and stacked it on this guy's porch. The guy came outside and he said, where's the rest of the wood? And I said, I'm so sorry. I'm not going to be able to deliver it. It's all cut up. It's about two miles away at our house. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what else to tell you. And he said, listen, I'll give you 50 bucks for the two cords, just tell me where it is, I'll have someone pick it up. And instead of being upset about losing the 100 bucks, I'd rather have 50 bucks than zero bucks. So I took it and got in the car and I quit the next day. That was my first business ever. And I didn't get back into the sales business until that was 10, so 13 years later. The last thing in the world I ever wanted to do was sales or be in business ever again. That's why I like theater so much, I think, because I could be on a stage just like this, pretending to be somebody else. Because at the time, I didn't really like being myself um, for lots of different reasons, right? And so I got into real estate. Actually, I got into it because I totally ran out of money. I don't know if you've ever lived in New York or any city, really, right? When you go to school, they don't tell you how to actually make money. I had no idea how to make money. And I went to school for theater. And then I went to New York City with no money. Nothing saved except for like $10,000 that I thought was gonna keep me going for like, like four years. Because I didn't really think it through. So when I ran out of money in the summer of 2008, a friend of mine said, listen, don't become a bartender. Don't become a waiter. You gotta stay in New York. If you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. And I'm not, I'm not from New York. I'm not from New York City. I went to college in upstate New York, but I only came to New York City because I thought that's the place where I could make something in my life, whether it was theater or something else, and I choose success first. And so when my friend said, listen, get into real estate, it's amazing, you can put apartments ads on Craigslist and you can sell them through the phone, it's incredible, and he had like nice suits, I didn't even own a single suit, he had a cool apartment, I was living in 200 square feet in Koreatown, sharing a bathroom with 16 people. And so I said, screw it, I got my real estate license. Fine, that's what I'm gonna do, great. I am now a licensed associate realtor, which is basically everyone else's second or third or fourth career. Because no one wakes up and says, you know what I wanna be? Hated. <laughs> I wanna be a realtor. I wanna be a real, no, no one ever says that. At least they didn't 13 years ago. And so I got my license and I started, and my first day was September 15th, 2008 the day Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy, that day. 
And the only reason I know that was because I was in the conference room and I was super excited for my first day and everyone was just sitting there staring at the TV, watching the stock market completely tank. But for me, the best part about that day, I didn't lose any money because I didn't have any money. I just thought everything was going to be really, really hard. All my first clients, my first rental clients, because that's really what I did. I didn't get into real estate to make it a career. I didn't get into it to be hoorah, I'm going to be the greatest real estate agent ever. I got into it so I could pay my rent and pay my bills. My monthly bills at the time were 1500 bucks a month. My rent was $1,100. My food and expenses was 400 bucks. If I could make 1500 bucks a month, I could stay in New York City and I would figure something out. And it was really, really hard. But you know what? I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to do it because I cannot just snap my fingers and change my circumstances. But maybe if I switch my energy around and look at this a bit differently, then I can figure out how to change my life and actually make something of myself here. And this real estate thing, this sales thing is kind of just like theater too, right? That's the business of it. The business for me is the selling, is the work, is the improv, is the working with people. Let me look at all the other people that are doing really, really, really great. What kind of business are they doing? All right, they're doing big sales. All right, how do I do that? No one's gonna trust me. I'm barely in this business. I've been in this business for like six months. I want the stuff no one else wants. There's one listing at 45 West 67th Street, apartment 15 ABC. I remember every single apartment number and every client name, by the way, forever. 15 ABC, Kathy Comerford, that was her name. And I went to her, I found her email because she had been a FISBO for a little bit, which means for sale by owner. And she had had five brokers and she had fired them all. And I reached out to her and I said, the last price you had is an actual price. I think I can get it. I'm your guy. And she responded because probably she responds to every broker. We met and she convinced herself to give me the listing. And it was my first listing at eight and a half million dollars that was worth like four. But boom, flag, that's it. I am now a luxury broker because I've got a listing that is luxury, eight and a half million bucks. I don't care what other brokers think. Or the guy Biff who dropped all the wood and let me leave my little brother in the bush. Screw all those people. All I gotta do is plant that luxury flag. That's the business, that's the work. That's what I'm gonna do. No one showed up, no one wanted it. Classic. And then one day I get a random call from somebody overseas who I will call uh, Mr. X because if I call him something else, he'll kill me. And so Mr. X calls and he says, I want that apartment. It's like, you gotta be kidding me. It's like, no, that one looks good. The one that's on the park. Yeah, yeah, yeah I want that one. I'm like, okay. It's like, I wanna make an offer. How much can I offer? Uh, $8 million? Sure. It's like, okay, I offer eight. Hung up the phone, gave me his email. It's like, what just happened? Did I just get an $8 million offer from some mysterious foreign billion millionaire? What is happening? I'd only done like thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollar a month deals in my entire life. I'd never really done a sale, like ever. <clears throat> Except now I had this big flag and now I have this buyer that wants to buy it. I'm like a total amateur. I didn't vet it, I didn't do anything. I called up my client right away because now I'm the best. I said, I've got you an offer. She said, no way. I said $8 million. And she said 8.3, wrap it up. <laughs> All right. I tried to star 69, the phone thing, you know? That didn't work. But he gave me his email and I reached out to him and I said, I've got a counter for you, $8.3 million US. You gotta be specific. Um, but I need a uh, proof of funds because I'd heard other brokers talking about that. Proof of funds, I need proof of funds. And I didn't wanna tell anybody else I was working with because I didn't want them to come in and snipe my deal. Proof of funds, I need proof of funds. Three days later, I get a DHL with like a piece of paper in it with a photo of an accountant. And on the back of it, it said, and I'll summarize, Mr. X can afford the apartment at 45 West 67th Street, apartment 15 ABC. Mr. X does not commit to things that Mr. X does not commit to. Huh, that's good enough for me. That's a proof of funds. That's basically a bank statement right there. <laughs> I emailed him and said, Mr. X, I got your proof of funds and it checks out. Please let me know your response to our counteroffer of $8.3 million. Also, I'm like totally freaked out this whole time because again, like I did with my first wood sale, when I was going to get that hundred bucks, all I'm thinking about is the money. You'd think I would have learned 14 years later, but nope, nope, definitely didn't learn. So all I'm thinking about is 3% 
of $8.3 million. That's like $100 billion, right? <laughs> I'm going to be rich forever. And then I realized, wait, Mr. X doesn't have a broker. This is a direct deal. And in New York, I can double end it 6% of $8.3 million. I'd never made that kind of money in my entire life. So now all I'm focused on is I got to get this thing done. And then he didn't respond to me. He ghosted me completely. Like, oh, my first huge client, my first big deal. I can't now go $2,000 a month rentals to Jessica Jessica and her friend Jessica with the split walls, you know, on 31st Street. Like, that would totally suck. A week later, he finally replies and says, okay, fine, send contract. It's like, what? <coughs> Are you kidding me? I'm rich. I'm the greatest business person in the world. If I could do this to a foreign whoever heir, I can do this forever. Amazing. So I introduced him to an attorney. The attorney's name was Brian. I was like, listen, this guy totally checks out. Don't ask me how, I just know. He's totally gonna buy this apartment. Everything's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be great. Got the contract together. My seller is on top of me. Mr. X disappears again, vanishes. Stops returning phone calls, stops returning emails. A month goes by. I contract out for a month, nothing happens. Following up with him left and right, trying to find different ways to get in touch with him. I'm like Googling a little bit and he kind of exists on the internet, but like also kind of doesn't. And then someone tells me, hey, you've just been part of your first scam. Good job. My first scam? What do you mean? I don't, I don't, I don't, there's none, of this, none of this money is mine. Like, oh no, no, this is what happens. People from around the world come to New York City. They take contracts out in English in New York from New York attorneys for property. And then they go around the world and they shop it. And they take 25,000 from this person, 25,000 from this person, because that listing had been on the market forever, started at $14 million. And now he's going to say to everybody, he's got an amazing deal with this American broker and he's going to steal everybody's money. And you just helped him. Awesome. Well, that's a super negative way to think about this. So let me just keep following up. And I followed up and followed up and followed up and followed up and followed up. And then one day I'm on the West side highway in a taxi cab. I think just drinking like an iced chai latte to drown out my sorrow. And Brian, the attorney calls me. He's like, you're not going to believe this. He's like, what? I just got a wire for $830,000 from the bank of X uh, into my escrow account, you're in contract for 45 West 67th Street. Like my whole life just flashed before my eyes right there. Way better than selling firewood for a hundred bucks. I just sold an apartment for $8.3 million. Hadn't closed yet, but I just put it in contract, called up the seller. She was so freaking excited, unbelievable. I clicked it. I said in contract on the internet. That's like a big deal for us real estate agents who go online and say in contract. Just to let all you people know, you all said I wasn't going to be able to sell it. You have no idea who I am, but I just put this thing in contract. Definitely closing. Nothing shady about this deal whatsoever. <laughs> totally fine. Same guy told me it was a scam. He's like, oh yeah, no. He probably wants to keep it in contract for longer and he's probably going to wash the money now. So now you're definitely involved in like a big money laundering process. It's like, oh, so do I get my commission though? Like if it closes, am I just a party to the deal? Or like, am I like a party to the deal? Again, this is still the work, right? This is still the business. Make a long story short, he disappeared for five months. Five months, that thing was in contract. People were trying to sue each other, but there was no one to sue because the guy was totally, totally banished. It's this whole blur of a thing. And then one day he calls me, I'm in my apartment, all hope lost because sales just sucks. And it is so hard. He says, Ryan, I'm in New York City, I'd like to close. It's like, what? What? One day, dude, one day I'm gonna be in Athens, Georgia and I'm gonna tell this story and no one's gonna fucking believe it. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, where are you? Do you wanna do a walkthrough? Do you, like, what do you, what do you wanna do? It's like, meet me in my hotel, Mandarin Oriental, 59th. I'm like, okay, great. Wonder if you're even gonna show up. Go up there, I tell everybody, everyone's freaking out, we're gonna go to the closing. Go up there, he's not there doesn't come down. Four hours later, he eventually comes down with a whole entourage behind him. The same entourage, one of them is like an espresso assistant. It's like this whole thing. A fleet of black Escalades, like armored out, floors it in front of the Mandarin Oriental in New York City, comes out, says, sorry, I'm late. Let's go for a ride. <laughs> Mom, <laughs> I know, I know what I told you that one time and I made it back alive. This time, I don't know. 
I'm like, where do you want to go? Do you want to see other apartments? What do you want to do? He's like, no, we go to airport. I'm like, no, 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 no. Uh, yep, yep, yep. I got into this business to pay my rent and my food, 1,500 bucks a month. What am I doing in this situation? Why do I say yes to the weirdest things? We go to JFK and we go to the back part of JFK where I'd never even been before. We get back there. Like, I don't know what's happening. He's like, we just have to do one thing. And then we'll go back into the city. We'll buy that apartment. Like, OK. There's this huge private airplane, jet, something. I don't even know. It didn't have any like American Airlines, none of that on it. He goes out there. He meets some guy. He goes up, comes out, signs paper, gets inside the car. We go back to the city, buys that airplane, goes into the city, buys the condo, wants to take a photo of me for his BBM profile, and continues from that day on to do about $350 million worth of deals with me. He's one of the wealthiest people in the world that you'll never know, and he just doesn't care. And one night, he was drunk in his house, on the internet, looking at real estate porn in New York City, trying to figure out what to do with eight or $10 million, because when you make a billion a month, you gotta kind of figure out what to do. And he clicked a thing and picked up the phone and had a drunk phone call with a kid in New York City, due to the time difference, who thought he was serious with no intention of ever buying it, ever. Except that kid in New York City kept following up and stayed on top of him. And eventually he just, and he told me this, felt bad. <laughs> my second big deal of my entire life. From firewood to that guy. After the closing, he was like, do you want to go out and have drinks? I was like, no. You need to stay, and I'm sorry for swearing, I had sensitivities, I apologize, but like when I, when I remember this moment, it just like really, really takes me back. But that's the business, you know, that's the work, and that's where I learned to do the work. Fast forward from that day to last year, pandemic, I'd been trying to figure out how to start my own business, start my own company, how can I break the mold, go untraditional, and I couldn't get out of the brokerage I was out because the business was too big. How do I leave a business that I'm at when I have 600 listings and 65 people, it's too hard. But then, God showed up. It's like, hey, coronavirus. I'm going to shut down the world for six months. You're good. Every single deal died that we had on March 18th of 2020. And it freaked us out for a second. But then I looked at it and said, with every failure and every piece of fear in my gut, that's just my body's way of telling me that's an opportunity. Let's go. And we put the business together really quickly under the cover of darkness, went into like a secret office, put it all together, and we launched last year. October 1st was actually our one year anniversary, and that's when we did the 900 million over the whole year, and so it worked. I got a listing for a townhouse, $15 million in Chelsea. No one could sell it because it was really short, so it was tough. It was like a super vertical square Rubik's Cube. We created a video of it because it had a pool in the basement. We put it out there on YouTube. We figured out how to do social ads before people were really doing them. And I started targeting wealthy kids because kids watch YouTube. Parents don't watch YouTube. People always ask me, they're like, hey, yeah, so you have a social presence, whatever. But people that are buying expensive real estate, they're not on TikTok. I'm like, no, they're not. Guess who is? They're kids. An 11 year old girl saw that video, showed it to her mom who was looking for townhouses on the east side. Her mom saw it, showed it to her real estate agent. Her real estate agent called me. They came, they bought that house for $13 million. Otherwise, I would have seen it because otherwise it was just pretty photos up on the internet and they weren't even looking in that side of the city. Last Friday, I sold an apartment for 11 million bucks, 224 Mulberry Street, fifth floor, through Instagram, 100%, totally honest. Because the power of exposure and putting that content out there for me, core identity, consistent content, and then you shout it from the mountaintop. And what I mean from that is the power of PR. Get your business out there into local publications. It turns into bigger publications. People read editorials and they believe them. They see advertising and they feel like you're pushing your message onto them. It's a very real thing between push and pull from your message. And I wanted to pull as many people into my message as I possibly could. I want to be the broker that does 10 million plus. So guess what? I tell everyone I'm the broker that does 10 million plus. And if I tell everybody, they'll believe it and then I will make it so because I want to be the greatest broker in the history of the world. And from there, it just steamrolled. 44 million here, 33 million here. I was just sitting backstage right now trying to figure out the discrepancy between a closing cost and a $33 million deal on the Upper East Side, but I'll figure that out after I'm done with you guys because I'll be in the car. I got to drive two hours back to Atlanta. That's enough time to talk this wife off a ledge. I can do it. I've done it before. Power 
of Brandt. I can't change my circumstances, but I can change my energy to change my life. How do I stop pretending like I'm an amateur? And how do I start acting like I'm the adult, like I'm the professional that I want everyone to treat me like? Information, theater, I'll just memorize. That's it. If anyone ever asks me a question I don't know the answer to, I'm just going to start talking to them about stuff I do know the answer to, just like a politician. Because that's how it works. And that's when I thought about, okay, all I had to do was I bought a suit, I put a car and driver on a debit card, and I just told myself that I was the greatest broker ever, and it worked. I'm gonna do this every day. I started writing down on a piece of paper who I wanted to be two years from now. And I still do that all the time because I wanna start being that guy today. My role model is that guy, not anybody else, because I worked for that person. Me, two years from now, me 10 years from now, I'm gonna be that person. 2020 is already, 2021 is over. Before we know it, we're gonna wake up and it's 2022, 2025, 2030, and it goes by so fast. Yourself and the future, that's who you work for. I want that guy to be happy. Otherwise, you know, I hope he'll be successful and he'll have to like come back in time and kick my ass. And I don't want him to do that. I want him to be super happy with the work I'm putting in today because what I do today is done. It's over, right? It's done. I want to have that type of energy. And that's what big money energy really is. It's big magnetic energy. It's that unwavering confidence for what you do because you believe it so strongly in your core that it becomes that brand and you can tie it back into your business. So you can have the greatest business with the strongest brand and unwavering energy to build a successful career. Happiness is wanting what you get. But if you can be happy with your success at any point in your life, then that is a life of fulfillment. Thank you so much.